Well, welcome to the services this morning at Kegley Baptist Church. If you're watching with us at home, we're grateful to have you with us. And uh, whatever means, with on our website or the, the YouTube site or so like that, glad to have you here with us this morning. Trust it will be a blessing to you for coming. It is Easter Sunday morning in a quite unusual, unique circumstances. So um, to make it as much of a church service as possible for you, We'll ask a couple of folks that have asked to join with us this morning in special music. If you'll come at this time, we have Brother Steve Ellison, our song leader, Miss Nancy, our church organist, and um, lovely Miss Bethany and Mark also going to join with us this morning. This is our special music this morning, and the folks in our audience and Caleb Ellison on the piano. And this is it. We'd like to sing on this Easter Sunday morning, Christ the Lord is risen today. the Lord is risen today. Ah, ah, alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, ah, alleluia. Praise your joys and triumphs on. Ah, alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Let's pray together. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you in prayer. We're grateful we may come. Bless each and every one that's come this direction this morning um, through media, dear Father, and in spirit. We ask that your Holy Spirit meet with, meet with each and every family at home, wherever they may be. And dear Father, again, on this special Sunday, 
May it be special because of you. We ask for your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. There's a church in the valley by the wild wood. No lovelier place in the dale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the wild wood. Oh, come to the church in the dale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. Sweet on a clear Sunday morning To listen to the clear ringing bell His tones so sweetly are calling Oh, come to the church in the veil Oh, come, 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 come Come, come to the church in the wild wood Oh, come to the church in the dale spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. Amen. That's an old traditional church song from years ago. And so is this one also. Several lovely verses to it. We'll sing all three verses of I Will Meet You in the Morning. I will meet you in the morning by the bright river's side when all sorrow has drifted away. of life's long dreary day. I'll meet, meet you in the morning, in the morning meet you in the morning. With a how how do, you do, do you do? How do you do? Sit down by the river. Sit down by the river. Rapture Exchange the old cross for a crown. There will be no disappointments, and nobody shall die in that land when life's sun goeth down. I'll meet you in the morning. Meet you in the morning. Rapture, all the 
Thank you all. Appreciate it. An older song that had to do with meet you in the morning. Well, we hope to meet each other, one another here soon. And uh, Lord willing, uh, we'll t take it as the, the Lord's will when we can be back together and meet one another. Well, I was think, thinking even while we're singing, uh, Miss Nancy's here, but not the grandkids. Not Louie or Kelly either, but not the grandkids. And we haven't even seen Chris and Brittany's little baby yet here at church. And I feel by the time we get back to church, Abby Smith will be five foot ten, and everybody changing so quickly. But uh, Lord willing, in the Lord's will, be soon. Glad to have you with us. I trust it be a blessing to you for being with, here with us. And um, Lord willing, tonight uh, we will have the service streaming at six o'clock. If you want to join us. And Wednesday night, Bible study at 7 o'clock. I'm considering on the Bible study going back and forth each and every Wednesday night with um, the adult lesson on salvation and then every other night the youth Sunday school lesson on the great questions of the Bible. I'm afraid that I'm getting into some of these lessons and about 10 minutes in, the young people are cutting out on me and leaving. I hope not, but I'm thinking about doing that and having a, a, youth, a youth lesson mixed in every other service. We'll see as, as that goes. And uh, we received a, a text, and uh, or we received a message from the Wilds Christian Camp earlier, earlier this week. And they're following the same protocols as everyone else as they've had to cancel camps and retreats up to this time. But as of now, they have not canceled any of the summer youth camps. They'll cross that bridge later in May. And so we're gonna take it that way also that we're still planning to go to camp uh, Lord willing, and uh, we have 48 young people signed up to go to camp. I was expecting a great year. Brother Scott Pauley is going to be the evangelist that week, and uh, several good uh, evangelists for the boot campers. But we'll have to, like I said, cross that bridge when it comes, but right now we'll still plan on going. And if that week doesn't work out, maybe also, there'll be opportunity to switch it for a week later in the summer as, as they make those uh, available. So I make that announcement to the young people and folks planning on that. And I believe that'll pretty, pretty much do it. And uh, again, grateful to have each and every one here with us this morning. Uh, I, have, I have a handful here to look at once in a while during the service. But uh, again, I appreciate Miss April uh, helping us to be able to film this. And uh, with a, a little bit of new equipment this week in filming. We're, we're doing a little bit different to be prepared for the services in the days ahead. So I hope it's coming through well there at home for you. And um, I believe that's pretty much all the announcements I have to make. So if you'll find your Bibles and be turning to John chapter 19, John chapter 19, before we come to the message, um, I'm going to read that passage of scriptures and then Miss Bethany and Mark's going to come sing for us. It's not a long scripture reading, it's just five verses, Mark, or John chapter 19, 
and verse number 25. We'll be in and out of this passage uh, several times, and we'll turn to several others, so if you want to mark it when we come back to it, that'd probably be beneficial too. John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put, a, put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I'm going to focus on, if you have a red letter edition of, of the scriptures, the three words in verse number 30, it is finished. And I trust it be a blessing to you for joining with us this morning. Let's have us a word of prayer. You pray with me at home or wherever you may be. And let's ask the Lord's blessings and the Holy Spirit anointing for the next few minutes together. Would you do that with me? Let's pray. Holy Father, once again, sacred and true, as we approach your throne, what a privilege. And we pray that this morning in each and every place, your Holy Spirit would bless. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Jesus Christ has overcome. He has risen from the dead. One day soon we'll see his face and every tear he'll wipe away. suffering Oh, praise Him for the mercy tree Wow, that was a special blessing to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. On what is a very uh, silent few days in the Lord's house of this past month, I can think that this celebration of Easter, the, the days of the cross and the days of Christ's resurrection were anything but silent. There was the Passover week when so many people would flood into Jerusalem. And at that time, um, I'm sure it was a very noisy and active city. And then there would be the flood of the people that would follow Christ up to Mount Calvary. There would be the jeering and the, um, the mocking. There would be the sound of the mallet and there'd be the sound of soldiers gambling. There'd be the sound of people weeping. There'd... I can't even imagine the sound that took place at Calvary. Can't even describe it. Then of course, shortly there and part of it would be an earthquake with that earthquake and the ground trembling and shaking buildings in Jerusalem rumbling so much and so strong that the veil of the temple was rent in two I read in a Bible uh, encyclopedia that that veil of Solomon's temple would be approximately 30 feet by 30 feet and over two inches thick so the rending of that curtain alone would be a sound to hear. I don't know when there's been sounds such as that, the sounds of Calvary. Creation, when God called everything into being from nothing, and the stars roared, their furnaces set on fire, or the great flood, when the fountains of the deep were opened up and the heavens opened, the storms, volcanoes, the tectonic plates, continents ripping apart and mountain ridges rising, what a sound. But I don't know that any of them could compare to the sounds of Calvary. There's seven statements recorded in the scriptures that Jesus spoke on the cross. I believe each of them is significant. There was something about each of them that was more than just, here's what I'll say before I die. The first words recorded is, I thirst. He was offered vinegar for his thirst at the beginning of the crucifixion or his placing upon the cross. He refused to drink it then. Like I said, the depth of the scriptures in John 18 verse 11 Jesus said that he must suffer the full wrath of his father or for sin, the cup that his father had given him. And I believe Jesus now is not receiving that, that antidote or that drink because he's not going to quench that thirst, that thirst that people will cry out in hell when they suffer for all eternity. Jesus is not going to quench the cup of God's wrath on him at that moment. He will say, I thirst here before he yields up the ghost. And this time he receives the vinegar because now he knows something is finished. And he may. He cries on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He cries on the cross and we see in this passage, Woman, behold thy son and behold thy mother. And from that moment on, we believe the Apostle John took Mary, the mother of Jesus, into his own house to care for her. This, as some commentaries say, is Jesus' last fulfillment of the law. Honor thy father and thy mother. And in his very, some of his last words, he took care of his mother. 
He said on the cross to the thief, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt thou be with me in paradise. What a marvelous conversation that the thieves had, and one railed on him, Save yourself and save me, but the one thief acknowledged that Jesus had done nothing amiss and asked the Lord to remember him when he came into his Father's kingdom. And Jesus said today. Jesus would cry out, um, and this is translated even in our English Bibles, L-O-I, L-O-I, having to do with God, God the Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Only time in all of creation and the only time in all of eternity that the Father and Son would be separated. I'm passing over the sixth statement, coming to the seventh, where it says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And Jesus willingly laid down his life, volitionally. That's interesting because even the Lord had already said, No man taketh my life, I give it. And even Pilate, don't you know you stand in, in, in condemnation to death? And Jesus said, no man, you don't have that authority. That authority comes from above. So Jesus willingly yielded up the Spirit. But I come back to that sixth statement. It's significant, I believe, because in the Scriptures, we traditionally know it as the number of man. And that is when Jesus, in this passage, in John chapter 19, verse number 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. It's an, it's an old pun, it's an old joke, an old riddle, where a teacher is standing before a class and it's time of the spelling bee and she looks at little Junior there and says, Chrys Chrysanthemum, that's a hard word, that's a difficult word. Can you spell it? And Junior said, Yes, I can. And he stood up and he, she said, Then go ahead. And he said, I-T. I can spell it. I looked up in the dictionary, just what is it? The dictionary says, the one previously, or that one previously mentioned, used as a subject, direct object, indirect object, or an object of a preposition for a non-human entity. An ir, um, shall we say, Definition two, used as the subject of an impersonal verb. Number three, used to refer to a crucial situation, culmination, or cause. We have it here in this passage. In that usage, it is finished. Used to refer to a crucial situation or culmination. What is finished? What is is it that Jesus said in this number of man, it is complete. It has been satisfied. It is finished. I read in the scriptures and see some things as I lead to this definite, what's being said here. I know when it commenced. I know when it began. The scriptures say in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was revealed in the flesh. I would like to say, at first of all, it commenced when, when God came in human form and took upon him the form of flesh or in the form of likeness of sinful man, the incarnation. But it's more than that. That is just simply a part of it. It commenced, as I read in the scriptures in 1 Peter, I'll turn to it. Rather quickly here, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. For as much as we know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Redemption. Deliverance. Salvation. Didn't come by valuable precious metals. Didn't come from coinage of silver and gold. The being redeemed didn't come by the vain traditions of men. It didn't come by from religio religiosity or religious works. While well, today is ripe, Easter Sunday is ripe with religious pageantry. 
verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, redemption by the, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Not with money, not with precious metals, not with religious pageantry. Redemption comes by the blood of the Lamb. Redemption comes through the anointed one, Christ. Redemption comes not just with the incarnation that he became in flesh, but this was pre-planned, this was prepared, this was in the mind of God before the world ever began. When it commenced... It commenced with God. It commenced before there ever was a creation or a world. It commenced beyond and before our understanding and comprehension. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known in us the mystery of his will. What's the mystery of his will? What has he made known to us? Before we were ever even born, before there ever was a moon, a star, before there ever was a garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve, it was already in the will, the plan, and the mind of God to redeem fallen man through the blood of Jesus Christ. Even in the book of Revelation, there's an acknowledgement of this. There's those who worship the Antichrist, and as we said in last week's message, and cannot believe because of the strong delusion of who he is. But it won't, it won't confuse, it won't deceive the elect who are, have their names written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When it commenced in the heart and the love of God before there ever was a man how it was compressed. That may seem like a strange word this morning to use as they lead to, to what it is. How it was compressed might help define this. In Luke chapter 9, we'll back up a gospel, Luke chapter 9 and verse number 20, Jesus knew what was coming in his earthly ministry. And the great declaration in Matthew chapter 16, when he'd ask, who do men say that I am? Then asked Peter, whom do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ. It means the ordained, the anointed one of Christ, of, the, of God. P for a purpose, for a plan. You're the Messiah. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. After that, that great declaration upon that rock I will build my church, Jesus began at that moment to, exp to tell them that he must needs go into Jerusalem to suffer and to die at the hands of wicked men. Right there, Simon, oh, but he recoiled at that. In Luke chapter 9 and verse number 20, here's another occasion, or another gospel sharing that same thing. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, said unto the Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things. Be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain and be raised the third day. He's telling them these things. He will repeat that again later in Matthew chapter 20, how he must be crucified. Did they not get it? What do you mean by how it was compressed? Well, first of all, that God became flesh. John chapter 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians chapter 2 tells us who Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of sinful men, and being conformed or made in that likeness, humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross, that God, eternal being, would be placed into the womb of the Virgin Mary, would be placed in flesh, would be placed and confined to a body, the God of all power and eternity, placed. But I say this, but placed for a short amount of time. The God of all eternity compressed to a 33-year ministry. The God of all eternity placed into a three-year public ministry. We read in the Gospels that at 30 years of age, Jesus was baptized of John and Jordan River. 
and announced to the world, this is my beloved son. And for the next three, just a little over three years, Jesus would travel no farther than about a 90 miles north-south uh, uh, distance and a, no more than a 30, 35, 40 mile uh, width. And in that little region, we call it Israel today, that little region of Galilee, the great eternal God ministered. And but for those three years of public ministry, oh, nearly almost three and a half. But more than that, for the hour that he came, compressed in time down to Jerusalem, the week of the Passover. Jerusalem, seven days of his passion. Then not just down to the seven days of the passion, then be taken in the garden. And maybe within the next 12 hours to go from a trial, from judgment hall to trial, to be compressed to those 12 hours. And then at the conclusion of those 12 hours, to approximately maybe 9 o'clock in the morning, be placed on a, uh, on a cross on Calvary. And for the next six hours, the eternal Son of God compressed to placed and held to that cross for that purpose for that short amount of time. I realize what's being compressed here. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 when the scripture says he has laid on him or he hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus has been experienced betrayal. He has experienced betrayal by his creation. He's being, he's being betrayed by the law. Those who know it best, the scribes, they know the law. He's being betrayed. He's being betrayed by the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the ones who would know and keep the law and administrate the law, and teach the law to the people. He's being betrayed by the teachers. He's being betrayed by the religion. He's being betrayed by the law. He's being betrayed by creation. He's being betrayed by the highest order of his creation. He's being betrayed by man. He's, we, of course, think first and foremost of Judas. Judas coming in the garden knowing where Jesus would be praying at that late night hour and leads the multitude. But it's not that they all forsook him and fled. Peter's now warming himself by the fire. He's being questioned by the maid. Your speech betrays you. You're, you're surely one of his followers and close followers. And P Peter will curse and say and deny him and say, I know him not. He's betray being betrayed by the one who just previously said, Thou art the Christ. And now within earshot, Jesus hears him curse his name. He's being betrayed by Judas, that most trusted one, who in the other apostles thought that he would be so honorable that he's the treasure and keeps the bag. He's being betrayed by his closest consorts. He knows what is the betrayal, the accusations. This will lead immediately to the floggings, the beatings, and the beating. This will lead him to him being stripped. I find this, I find this uniqueness of this. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they hid themselves. Why'd they hide? For they knew they'd sinned. They couldn't stand before a righteous God. The scriptures are clear to me that they, they were shamed. They're shamed out of the condition they found themselves. They were before in righteous innocence. They could stand before God naked, but now in their nakedness of sin, they're ashamed and they hide themselves. The Bible tells us that when Jesus, when they stripped him of his robe and they, in the Roman tradition and they hung him naked upon the cross, now he bears our shame. Isn't it something though that by faith, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ and receive his robe of righteousness and he imputes to us his righteousness through faith, isn't it something the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon him shall not be, not be ashamed. We are clothed in his righteousness. We don't have to hide anymore. We can come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? We have a covering he prepared for us. He knows what it's like now to be in the likeness of sinful man and hang ashamed on a cross. We see that he's insulted. The thief will rail on him and cast on him. The people that by, pass by will rail and cast accusation. Oh, if thou be the Son of God, if you be the Messiah, save yourself. You saved others. Save yourself. Now what an accusation. Prove it. This who you say you are? Show us now. Oh, I know he could have. I'm reminded that he said to Peter, put up your sword in the garden. 
For the Son of Man hath available to him twelve legions of angels. In my imagination, I see the angels with their hands on their sides and their swords, whatever that could possibly be in God's glory of the, uh, the, glorify, uh, the host of heaven. I can see them with their hands on the sword saying, just say the word. Just say come. We'll come. Hath he not given his angels charge over thee that lest you dash your foot against the stone? This is not a dashing. This is a crucifixion. I can see the angels saying, just breathe a word and we'll be there. And people pass by and they rail on him and accuse him. I can see as they spit upon him. What, what disgusting, uh, what, what um, low. I see this crown, the crown of thorns is placed upon his head. I didn't intend to dwell on all the things, but just so we get an eye, this is not accident. I go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearken unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life now the earth the ground was cursed it'll no long, longer bring forth as the beautiful garden of Eden um, even the Bible tells us Romans the whole creation groaneth and and travail, travail waiting to be delivered because even the, even the terrestrial earth is cursed. He went on to say, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the fall of man, when God cursed the earth, the things that he mentions is thorns and thistles. Now isn't it something when you say betrayal? That when Jesus is tried and when Jesus is condemned and when Jesus was placed on the cross, that someone would go out and find some bramble bush or some rose or some, some native thorn tree, a hawthorn, or, and they would wrap the green vines together into a wreath and someone would get the idea to come into the, pot, to the judgment hall, the praetorium, and come up to Jesus and said, you said you were a king, you said you were the king of the Jews, here's your crown. And the very crown they put on his head was the symbol of the curse, the thorns. He knows what it's like on Calvary to be numbered with the criminals. Back in Isaiah again, he said that he should be counted with the transgressors. If anybody was passing by that day, they'd heard nothing of the trial, they'd heard nothing of, of the accusations, and they just passed by with an eyesight, and they looked up on Calvary or on the mount, and they would look up there, they would see, and they would look and say, oh, the Romans are executing criminals today. How many? And maybe one would go one, two, three. Three criminals are being, well, I wonder what they did. Little did they know that two of them were malefactors, two of them were thieves, two of them were murderers, but the middle one was the innocent son of God. But he was counted as a criminal. When I consider it is compressed, those are just some of the things we know about it. But let's see if I can put it and get it a little more accurate, a little more relevant. <clears throat> I was reading about the universe. How dense is a star was the question I asked. Can you comprehend the size of the universe, the size of infinite space? There are said to be billions of stars in each galaxy, some more billions of stars than others. Billions of stars in each galaxy. There are, in each of these galaxies, billions of them. In each of these billion spinning galaxies with billions of stars are billions of light years apart from each other. That in these billions of galaxies, just take our solar system, each of, these, each of these galaxies have solar systems. If we were to take the earth and make it the size of a quarter, one quarter, our sun in comparison to the quarter would be nine feet tall. The next star, Sirius, would be 16 feet tall. 
The next star, Arturius, would be 234 feet tall. That's the size comparison to the Earth being a quarter. These are the stars in our, within our solar system. And Betelgeuse, that star would be 10,000 feet tall compared to our, our quarter Earth. What's the density of stars? Many of them are gaseous and have different varying weights. Those that have compacted themselves and transferred in as they fall in upon themselves as to white stars or nebula stars. If we could take one gallon of water on Earth, it would be eight pounds, about eight pounds. If we fill it with dirt, it'd be 10 pounds. If we'd fill it with iron, it'd be 65 pounds. The density of these nebulous stars, white stars as they, well, we take the nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, if we put a, one a gallon of Proxima Centauri, we'd have 450 pounds in our, pale, in our pale. The nearest star, Sirius B, if we put, we put that in our pale, one gallon of that in our pale, that bucket would weigh 10 million pounds. If we go to the nearest neutron star from this, and this is uh, almost incomprehensible, the nearest neutron star to Sirius B, it has been figured by scientists that if we put one teaspoon of that star in our bucket, it would weigh one billion tons. In that likeness, we'd have a one inch by one inch square, actually smaller than that one teaspoon, and it would weigh one billion tons. Now, do you comprehend that? I don't. There is no surface on the earth that they reckon that that square could be set in for it would crush its way through the earth and go on out into space. So great. In What's taking place on Calvary? I was reading in a Bible commentary, and who, can, who could know for sure? But folks... Folks reckon that by the time that Noah existed in the 1600 years and the generations, there may have been nearly 200 million people on the earth. Only eight got in the ark. But since the restart from Noah's flood to our day, then it's been reckoned that there's been literally billions and billions of people who've passed away. The current earth population right now is about 7.2 billion people. With those who have passed away since Noah's time, some have reckoned there could have been as little as 10 billion people. There could have been as many as 15 billion people. Who knows? But using someone far smarter than I and their studies and their regulations, if it be so, from starting from Adam to these times, that let's say there's been 15 billion people. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we were to take the sins of every person who's ever existed and gave them just one sin, we're talking about 15 billion sins. If we're to take every person that's ever lived and come to our modern times and, and we're talking, say, oh, let's just give everyone two sins, we're talking 30 billion sins. If we're to take everyone that's ever lived and we're to take every bad thought, every wicked thought, every wicked transaction, every war, every fight, every domestic dispute, if we were to compound every adulterous thought, every adulterous look, every swearing of God's name, and we were to add that to every person, we would have so many sins we couldn't comprehend it. And the Bible tells me that within those few hours on Calvary's cross, the perfect Lamb of God took the sins of all mankind and in those few minutes, in those short hours, He said He had paid for the sins of all of mankind. The wrath of God against all of man's sins were paid for at Calvary. And when Jesus said it is finished, how can that be? I've tried to think that through. But the only thing I can come up with is, is that Jesus is that great. He, Jesus is all he, that he could possibly be. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. He is the creator of the world. He is the one that was transgressed against. He is the one who, as the scripture said, is rich unto all that call upon him. He is the only one possibly, uh, possible that could have paid the sin debt for every 
person. And on Calvary, when, the, when he said, Why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible says, when we go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah, that he's holy, so awesomely holy that he cannot look upon sin. Jesus Christ, he hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus Christ, as the scripture said, he became sin for us. And at that moment, that greatest sacrifice, it was paid. It is compressed on Jesus. I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. It's confirmed. It commenced in the mind of God, and I'll close with that in just a second, but it is commenced within the mind of God before the world ever began. It was compressed, it was paid for in one person. The man Christ Jesus on Calvary. Verse number one. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Glad tidings. Good news. You want to hear some good news? In this times that we're living? Hey, I don't even know what to believe. One place I read the hospitals are overrun and they're chaotic and they don't know what to do. The next thing I read, hospitals are, don't have any people and they're laying off their staffs. I see, I see the mercy boat and comfort boat are pulled in to take care of the crowds of the hospitals and I find out within three weeks they, got, they don't have even 60 people on them. I don't even know what to believe. We find out that some places are allowed complete social interaction and the immunity people have, have built up and they have less problems of people being sick than folks who are quarantined and, and, and socially separated. I don't even know what to believe. I read one on one news report and see, read the exact opposite on another report. I see one doctor say this and look right over here and see another doctor say something different. I need some good news. I want to I want to have I want to have something that's confirmed and something I can believe in, something I can stand on. Well, that's what Easter's all about. I give you the gospel. I'm going to give you some good news which I preach to you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I preach in you, unless ye have believed in vain. Well, what did you preach to the Corinthians? What did you share? What was that good news that saved them? What's that good news that they're standing on? Let's see it. Verse number three. For first I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried. You don't bury life, people. You bury dead people. Christ died for our sins. How do we know that? They buried him. Three days and three nights. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And just like God said it would happen. Just like the prophets prophesied that it would happen. Jesus confirmed it by going to Calvary. Jesus confirmed it by being buried. Just like in Jonah, three days, three nights in the belly of the well. Jesus confirmed it. He rose again. Power, victory, or death, or sin, death, and the grave. He's alive. Well, you say, that's what the scripture said? Yep. And he was seen. Who, who was he seen by? Peter. Cephas. Who was he seen by? Mary. Who was he seen by? The women who ran to the tomb. Who was he seen to? Peter and John ran to the tomb. So it was just as they said. Who was he seen by? He was seen by the apostles who were in the room without Thomas. Whoa, and he walked in the room. Then when Thomas came back, he said, I'll not believe unless I see him. And he appeared unto them a second time. Who believed now, Thomas? Who believed after that? 500 brethren on the hillsides of Galilee saw him alive. Who believed after that? For 40 days. Acts chapter 1 tells us he ministered and taught alive in the regions of Galilee. And they saw him. Who believed after that? There was a man named Saul. Saul hated Christ. Or hated Jesus. Christ hated those that were of the way. The book of Acts calls it the way several times. Uh, Saul hated the church. He tried to wreck it. It was destroying his religiosity. Destroying what he thought was destroying all the law. He did everything possible. Who believed after that? And last of all, we see this. And after he was seen of James, then all the apostles, 
And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Later than the rest, different than the rest of them, a little bit farther down the road, on the Damascus road to be exact, Saul said, I went from an unbeliever to a believer. Why? Because I saw him. He's alive. I got good news, folks. As the founding president of Harvard University said many years ago in his, his treatise on the evidences and the study of the resurrection of Christ, the most confirmed fact that ever, of all things that ever happened in human history. What? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've got good news. I've got something you can believe. I'm going back to another Old Test or New Testament story. I think the, the question, I think of great questions for the young people. When Jesus came to Lazarus, the house of Lazarus and Bethany, he'd, he'd already died and been buried. Matter of fact, by the time Jesus got there, they would say, he's been dead yet four days, he stinketh. He set corruption set on. Martha had met him and said, if you'd been here, if thou hadst only been here, my brother had not died. Mary will end up saying the same thing. Jesus gives a classic statement to Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he dead, yet shall he live. Believest thou this? I'm the resurrection life. Not past tense, not future tense. Right there you're saying to, to Martha, I am now the resurrection life. Can you believe it? Would you believe it? Do you know what Jesus can do? And he that believeth on him hath everlasting life. It's confirmed. How do we know it's confirmed? As 1 Corinthians 15, 20 will go on to say, because as in Adam all die, but in Christ shall all live. Because he's alive. He's alive and well. It was about several years ago, I attended a funeral of a friend over in, in the state of Virginia. And uh, in that funeral service, the, the, the man who was conducting the service said something that I just... And spoke to my heart, and I said, yeah, that's true. He said, most funeral services, we tend to speak of someone who's passed away. And we seem to focus on as, as though they're dead. The truth of the matter is, they're more alive and well than they've ever been. And because Christ lives, I got good news. He is alive, and because Christ lives, you can live also. Eternally. How do you speak? How do you spell it? I'm going to come back to that. I'd like to say it's commissioned, but don't have time to go that. Let's save that for another time. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. It's commissioned, Mark 16, 15. Go everywhere telling folks he's alive. Go everywhere and tell everyone it has been paid for. Heaven's not earned. Not with silver, not with gold, not with metals, not with religion, not with tra traditions. It's paid for right, by the blood of the Lamb. How do you spell it? S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N, salvation. How do you spell it? R-E-D-E-E-M-E-D, -E 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 redeemed. How do you spell it? L O V E D. Loved. With an everlasting, incomprehensible love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is finished. Quit trying to work, quit trying to earn, quit trying to pay. What Jesus already paid for at Calvary. Quit trying to merit what he said was finished. In all the world, what, in all that's going on, what can I possibly believe except you be converted and come as little children? You shall know I enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. And on Calvary was compressed the sins of the whole world. And he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will not be ashamed. 
but have everlasting life. It's good news, isn't it? Let's close with a word of prayer this morning. Holy Fathers, we come to you in prayer for each and every one that's joined us someplace in some way this, today. I pray their hearts have been blessed to think. But before I ever walked this earth, in the mind and heart of God was redemption. Then on Calvary was placed my sins, past, present, and future. And dear Father, it's been confirmed on this special day, alive and well. I pray that there's some soul who's never believed or trusted in you. Would you, they believe that you are the resurrection today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back again at 6 o'clock tonight if you'd like to join us with the streaming. And um, for those who were here in 1992, I'm going to repeat a message. On the first Easter Sunday that I was here 28 years ago, the greatest message ever preached or ever shared. So I'm going to go back and say repeating the greatest message ever preached tonight, 6 o'clock, if you can join us. Lord bless you. Thank you.